It's time to play the game. Time to play the game. <laughs> Time to play the game! 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 <laughs> The WWE Fan Messiah. For all of you. That's right. You. 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 All of you. Have come to you at this moment in time. With a powerful and uplifting message. About the present. And even more importantly. The future of WWE. So please. Hear my words. Listen to my message. And accept it. In the cockles of your heart. And it goes a little something like this. <clears throat> Your false idols are oh so lame. Hunter once again has changed the game. All your vanilla midgets went quickly on passing. Long live the blue-blooded cerebral assassin. You can cling to all your little fanboy clicks. The Breakfast Club runs the world of backstage politics. A Roman Empire tried to overcome entering first. This would not end well, according to the Book of Hearst. You wanted to live out on the lunatic's fringes. Now you're ranting and shed social media binges. But I, your prophet, all the while conversely, choose to believe in the hunter the Hearst, and the Helmsley. The fans were hoping for anybody but Reigns. Now WWE stock price is set to make record gains. You all got behind AJ Styles and his phenomenal things. But Triple H is once and forevermore the King of Kings. Sadly, Carson Palmer just completed some big game choking. Fear not, Peyton Manning's cock the media is still so big at me stroking. While Cam's off to the Super Bowl for some big game Devin, Triple H will still skillfully continue with his big time power grabbing. Vince's son-in-law was the one true choice. As your prophet, thou shall heed my voice. Any other option? was a pretender, a fraud. Now put your hands in the air and say, praise God. I know it's a lot to take in and it's a powerful message. While well, you allow that to seep into the pores of your soul, who's ready to talk about the 2016 Royal Rumble? Well, this guy right here. Now I'd love to be able to sit here and lie to you and say that I was really looking forward to this entire Royal Rumble show or that I was excited about several matches on this card. But the simple fact of the matter is, the only thing I gave two flying fucks about was the Royal Rumble match. What was going to happen? Who was going to be in it? How was it all going to go down? And who was going to end up winning at the end of the night? How and why? That's all I cared about. The first almost two hours of this show was like a waste of time to me. It really was, because I just didn't care, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. But, oh, man, did this show deliver, and deliver in a mighty way. But in the meantime, until we get to that glorious, rapturous moment, let's talk about the other crap that happened at the 2016 Royal Rumble. I'd love nothing more to come on here and tell you that the Curtain Jerker match, the last man standing match for the Intercontinental title between Kevin Owens and Dean Ambrose, was a spectacular exhibition of professional wrestling that I could sit back and do all types of circle jerks to for the next several months to come. But the simple fact of the matter is, it was a fine match, it was a really good opener, and it was fun, but part of the problem of this show and the consequence of 
the Royal Rumble match was that everything else played a clear second fiddle. And you get to this point, and this match happens, and I'm like, this is cool and all, but can we get on with the show? And I'm sorry, that was just kind of my mentality throughout the entire course of the night. And sure, these guys busted their asses, and they worked hard, and there was at least some type of story reason for these two guys to have this type of match at this type of show. It was a necessary match for this show. It was an important match for this show. Um, me personally, I would have liked to have seen a double 10 count finish. That way, neither Owens or Ambrose goes over. I guess Ambrose going over is okay, but what does that really mean for Owens going forward? You know, it's just one of these kind of lose-lose situations to me. And I'm sure it probably killed it for you. This was great. This was awesome. But this was just nothing more than time-filled for me. The tag title match between the Usos and the New Day. There's one thing I'll say about this uh, It's really emblematic of a larger scale problem for the WWE. A fucking broken trumpet named Francesca is more over than probably 90 to 95% of the main WWE roster. It would be funny and hilarious if it wasn't so sad and true. And maybe when it comes to these two teams, these are two exciting tag teams. I should be chomping at the bit to see these guys wrestle at a major Big Four pay-per-view like the Royal Rumble. But the problem is, it feels like I've seen these guys touch so many times and wrestle each other so many times. Because they have, it just gets repetitive and I just end up tuning it out. The only thing I want to see come out of all of this going forward is what I've talked about before. You throw in the Dudleys in with these two teams, and you have a TLC match for the tag titles at WrestleMania 32. That's all I care about at this point with the tag division. My whole thing with the U.S. title match between Callisto and ADR is not the fact that these two guys are wrestling at a pay-per-view. You know, I'm happy to see the U.S. title defended at a Big Four pay-per-view. In fact, I was happy to see all these other titles besides the world title being defended at a Big Four pay-per-view like the Royal Rumble. That's a good thing. I thought that was a positive, encouraging thing for the night. Um, but my deal is, is that when I look at Kalisto and I look at ADR, they've already wrestled on Raw. They've already wrestled on SmackDown. I feel like there's no point in watching this match here because I could tune in the next night on Raw and watch the same exact basic fundamental match. So why bother? And I guess, other than the Royal Rumble match, you had to have one of these other mid-card belts change hands at the pay-per-view, and this was probably the best position to have one go down. This was the best situation to have one happen. But it doesn't seem very wise to take the strap off of ADR when he's supposed to be part of the League of Nations. Furthermore, it takes a lot of the pop and the joy out of Kalisto winning the U.S. title here when we already saw him do it recently on Raw. It just didn't have that same feeling that it should have here. As I get ready for the Divas title match between Becky Lynch and Charlotte, I'm like, okay, let's save the piss break until after the match. Let's give these gals a chance here. No, I don't particularly like Ric Flair with the pussy. It's just, no. And I think Becky Lynch looks stupid. And what really struck me as they were being announced for this match and they get ready to square off is I'm looking behind them and I see Eden, and I'm like, oh my god, fucking Eden is incredible. And I know I get down with certain flavors of ladies that maybe some of you don't. But seriously, you look at Eden as the ring announcer, and she's a thousand times sexier than these two heifers combined. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't care about Becky Lynch. I don't really care about Charlotte. And this is all just useless foreplay to me. Until you get to my Dream Mania's Divas match, which I've already talked about before, and we'll talk about it again. And frankly, I can see why well, I didn't care about these two, because I frankly thought this match was kind of slow and plotting. I thought it was sloppy. If it didn't have Ric Flair there, it would have really stumped to high hell. That's just my opinion. I just didn't think it was a very good match. I thought it was sloppy, like you've got Becky Lynch falling before Charlotte's even chopped her. And what really pisses me off about this, and I'm not just doing this to pick on Charlotte, because I see this a lot. Other wrestlers shouldn't be using other people's finishers as non-finishing maneuvers. Charlotte using Roman Reigns' finishing maneuver, the spear, as a non-finishing move is stupid and ridiculous, and this type of shit needs to stop. But then, oh then, the match is mercifully over, and here comes Sasha Banks 
to one of the biggest pops of the night. And I pop my fucking self. I'm like, yay, here's Sasha Banks. What are they going to do with her? Are they just going to predictably send her immediately at Charlotte? No. She throws Becky Lynch out of the ring and says, this is my spotlight. And I'm like, ooh, this is kind of interesting. And then they're setting it up and teasing it where she's aligned with Charlotte. They're friends again. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of lame. And only the WWE would fuck up this obvious babyface moment for Sasha Banks to really get her over in this big way, only for them to sit there and dick tease us and say, nope, Sasha Banks is going to fucking <laughs> take Charlotte by the hair and give her the business and make that bitch tap. Sh Sasha was splendid here. I loved what this set up, how this was set up, and all we're missing is a Snoop Dogg. We're one Snoop Dogg away from an incredible Divas feud on the road to WrestleMania and an awesome Divas match at WrestleMania 32. So now that all the other time was filled and other people got their chances at a pay-per-view payout, great. Good for them. What the fuck ever. It's time to talk about what really mattered on this show. The 30-man Royal Rumble match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And I'll break this up into two major segments. Talking about numbers 1 through 29, and then what came at number 30, and afterwards, the finish of the 2016 Royal Rumble match. But let me start off first by talking about what happened during numbers 1 through 29 with some of the highlights and some of the lowlights for this Rumble match. Let's start off with some of the highlights, and I'll go to number three in AJ Styles, the Phenomenal One's debut in a WWE ring. I'm glad they're letting him use the AJ Styles name. Kudos to the WWE for that one. I thought he made a solid showing for himself. I was a little flustered at the fact that I don't recall them ever actually letting him hit the Styles clash on anybody. It's the WWE doing things the WWE way. They're going to make sure they let you know who's running the show and who the real kings are, if you will. But I thought AJ Styles, seeing him there at number three, um, I, I thought it was a great moment for the Rumble. You know, the one real true surprise we had in a show, in a match that could have probably used a few more. Uh, it was great to see AJ Styles. It was also cool to see uh, Y2J, Chris Jericho, and his dad bod rock over 40 minutes in this Royal Rumble match. Fucking Chris Jericho. Oh, and that middle-aged men might not hit the gym with the same fury and passion that they once did, but they can still get it done when it matters most. Our truth spot. He comes into the middle of the freaking match at what, number 12, I think it was. And he's bringing out the ladder like it's a Money in the Bank ladder match. You know, you need those funny moments, those funny spots in a Rumble match. And our truth most certainly provided it. One of the highlights of the night, and definitely, in my opinion, the funniest moment of the Rumble match. And every Rumble match has got to have that moment or two of humor in it to really make it go. And they got it here. Um, Kofi's big save, it's not the most spectacular one, but it was still kind of fitting that Big E caught him and Big E had him riding around on his shoulders. But really, to be honest with you, yeah, AJ Styles being there was great. But this was Brock Lesnar's bitch. Numbers 1 through 29, this was Brock Lesnar's bitch. And when he came out, I think it was at number 22, if I'm not mistaken, he was perfectly timed. 22 or 23, I think he came out, 23. He was perfectly timed because, man, oh, man, did the Rumble match need him at this point. And Brock Lesnar was a star. I mean, Brock Lesnar came out, and it was a command performance. You see a Brock Lesnar in this type of setting and the way he was featured, and you're saying, man, this guy is fucking badass. This guy is a fucking monster. This guy is cool as shit. And it was nice to see somebody being featured in a way and presented in a way and booked in a way where you didn't run from the cool factor. You didn't hide from it. You embraced it. You went with it. The WWE realized they needed Brock Lesnar to kind of help piece together this match, to help, frankly, kind of save this match. And damn it all, wouldn't you know that that freaking square flat top meathead Jimmy John salesman sure the fuck did everything he could to shine on this night 
and make this his match as much as anybody else's. But unfortunately, with this Rumble match, 1 through 29, there were a lot of lowlights for me. Uh, you look at number four, I think it was. Tyler Breeze is out there. What the fuck is this Hammenager jobber who's not even being featured on Raw doing in the fucking Royal Rumble match? This is ridiculous. They gave Tyler Breeze a spot over Big E. Hell, they gave Tyler Breeze a spot over Xavier Woods. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. They gave Tyler Breeze a spot over one of the Usos. I mean, just astoundingly Freaking ridiculous. And then we go to our true spot. You know, with a show that lacked surprises in this Rumble match, we probably could have used one or two more because that was part of the appeal of the Rumble match these last several years. You wasted a spot on our truths ladder spot. You know, like I said, it was fun and everything, but then you're like, again, they kept Big E out of the Rumble match to do this with our truth. Eh. We didn't get somebody like a taker here, but we got something like our truth spot. Eh. And then we get to the whole thing, and sure, a lot of you thought it was great. You know, Kevin Owens and AJ Styles go back and forth a little bit, and then he eliminates AJ Styles. And out comes Sami Zayn, hooray! And he comes and gets vengeance on Kevin Owens. No, I don't fucking like this, because all these fucking years later, it's like it's the road to final battle, goddamn 2010. It's Kevin Steen versus El Generico all fucking over again. At some point in time, enough is enough with this fucking madness and stupidity. And Sami Zayn hit the am machine, Jesus Christ. A Kofi's elimination. And with all the shit they were doing with Vince coming out with the League of Nations and fucking up Roman Reigns, apparently we missed Kofi's elimination. And it was lame, and it was dumb. And it's even lamer and dumber that we freaking didn't even see it happen. It came up in a replay several minutes later. I'm sitting there watching with Ashley, and I'm like, what happened to Kofi Kingston? Where is he? They're not at ringside. He must have got eliminated. A couple minutes later, we find out he got eliminated. A Roman's early exit. This just speaks again to how the WWE, namely Vince McMahon, books himself and the authority. How stupid can you possibly be? The whole name of the game is to throw somebody over the top rope. Once you throw them over the top rope, they can no longer win the world title in this match. So, of course, the dipshits in the League of Nations sit there and pull his legs out from under him, pull Roman out through the bottom rope, which, of course, doesn't eliminate him. Then, of course, they go with the lame-ass three heels on a babyface beatdown and put him through the table and all this, and then they have Roman Reigns walk off because he's too much of a man to get wheeled out on a stroller. Eat that, Daniel Bryan and Mick Foley. But, you know, you do this whole thing, and then Roman kind of comes back, and it's kind of lame. It kind of goes over like a fart in church. And I can't blame the people for not liking this because this was dumb. This was stupid. You, know, you would think, for the guy that runs the show that his character would be a lot smarter. That the first thing you would do is you would send in Sheamus and ADR and Rusev, three bigger dudes, you would think, and you're the boss, you could order everybody in there to immediately eliminate Roman Reigns and you just throw him over the top. I know it doesn't make for the best television. I know it doesn't make for the best finish to the pay-per-view event, the main event of the pay-per-view. But damn it, from a logical standpoint, you know, this is just ridiculous. I was also disappointed by the lack of surprises. AJ Styles at number three was really cool. That was really about it. Until you got to number 30. You know, this is for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. You would think a couple of the names of the past would want a shot at the belt. Would want a shot at their moment of glory. And we got almost nothing. Nothing. I was just stunned. And when you look at people like, again, I'm not just trying to pick on him exclusively, but Tyler Breeze is in this goddamn match. And Jack Swagger's in this goddamn match. You couldn't have... Our truth was in this goddamn match for that ladder spot, and then he was gone. You couldn't find a way to fit a surprise or two more in there? And then after you've got the Wyatt family, and Lester eliminates all three of them, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of building up to the fact that the Wyatt family's there. You know where it's going. You know where this is happening. What's going to happen? And you know what this is building to a WrestleMania? Oh, but Lester gets eliminated by the Wyatt family. And then he just walks off. 
Why in the fuck would he do that? Bray Wyatt is still in the goddamn ring. All these other things you were doing in the match were what you would expect a Brock Lesnar to do. And now he's walking up. That's the type of dumb shit you would expect a Roman Reigns type babyface to fucking do. A John Cena type babyface to fucking do. Hell, even Hulk Hogan in the 1992 Royal Rumble helped Ric Flair win his first WWE World Heavyweight Championship. He was the undisputed champion because Hulk Hogan went to shake Psycho Sid's hands, Sid Justice's hands, and pulled him out of the ring. And no, Sid didn't break his leg again. We had to wait nine years for that magnificence. So even Hulk Hogan did something a little bit on the dirty, he shysty side 24 years ago. But now we come here, Brock Lesnar, the man who ended the Undertaker's undefeated streak of WrestleMania, the top babyface that you have, the biggest badass that you fucking have, gets eliminated in a shysty, grimy fashion, fucking four-on-one beatdown, and it took multiple times for them to even do that. And he's just walking off to the backstage area with his tail tucked between his legs like a punk bitch. How the fuck do you make Brock Lesnar look like a stupid punk bitch? So, 1 through 29, I wasn't really digging this Rumble match. It was shaping up, frankly, to be quite lame and not very entertaining. Because even with some of the guys that lasted a really long time, Jericho didn't do a lot of spectacular shit. AJ Styles was disappointing in the lack of spectacular shit and the lack of showcasing that he was allowed to do. It just, it just Rumble had a really bad vibe to it. But then we got to number 30, ugh. Oh, we got to number 30, ugh. And number 30 is where business truly picked up. Number 30 is where the Royal Rumble began. The majesty of God's arrival. The majesty and magnificence of God's return. He has graced us mortals with his presence. Your prophet. Me, your prophet, you, 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 were warned of God's coming judgment for the Roman Empire. And the simple fact of the matter is, he's not here to play. He's not here to just play games. He's come to spit water, make daughters, and win world titles. And son of a bitch, that's exactly what he did and how glorious and magnificent it truly was. Since Survivor Series, as your prophet, your WWE fan messiah, I have tried to tell all of you, educate, inform, and enlighten all of you that everything that this company does is about one thing, and that is Triple H and WrestleMania. We merge them together. In Dallas, Texas, at AT&T Stadium on April 3rd, 2016. It is now called Triple H Mania. It has always been about Triple H's Mania match, and everything else is secondary. Oh, what a moment. When that revelation comes to pass, and all of you come to the realization that everybody else is playing checkers in the WWE, and God is the Grandmaster Chess Player. Oh, when Triple H eliminated Roman Reigns, you want to talk about a mark-out moment. And I love how the WWE did this. Some of you might have said, well, why didn't he re-eliminate Roman Reigns last? Because the way they wanted to do it, they didn't want to sit there and have him eliminate Roman Reigns last because it would fit into the mindset of the fans of anybody but Roman Reigns who were already fighting against the grain because Triple H got himself, of course, coming back number 30 is this big, massive kind of sort of surprise. A lot of people are going to get behind him. There's history. There's pedigree there, if you will. So now you got to sit there and get people to stop believing in God again, to get them to speak out against God, and the only way to do that is go living on the lunatic fringe for a minute or two and tease the mortals with the thought of Dean Ambrose possibly winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. But you know that wasn't going to happen. There was no chance in hell of that going down. And I thought this was great. And I think this was perfect, frankly. I love this finish. This is what I devoted three hours to on Sunday night. This was everything to me. There was only one option. There was only one choice here. For those of you that sit there and say, you can't have Roman Reigns drop the strap here. The fuck you can't. The fuck you can't. 
You go back to when The Rock, if we want to go there, when he won the title the first time at Survivor Series 1998, didn't he drop it back and forth a couple times to Foley before he ultimately dropped it back to Austin at WrestleMania 15? Did that hurt The Fucking Rock's career? Absolutely not. And frankly, based off of the way the WWE had positioned themselves and kind of boxed themselves and booked themselves into a corner, this was the only viable option. This was the only choice that they had. They had to put the strap on Triple H because it either sets up something big for Roman Reigns and him down the road at Triple H Mania or sets up something even bigger at Triple H Mania. Oh, baby. God. Okay. But furthermore, if you have Triple H lose here, he doesn't appear, or you just have Roman Reigns blow through everybody, even in the way they did it with this lame, he's gone for half the damn match to catch a breather and pour some water on his frickin' black flowing locks, now he comes back, he wins the Rumble. Who the fuck is going to be a believable opponent for him at WrestleMania 32? This was the only option. This was the only choice. And for the WWE, following through on doing the right thing, I say amen and hallelujah. Praise God on everything that is the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. You want to talk about an exciting road to WrestleMania? You people don't even know what excitement is. The fun has only just begun. And it's all due to one man. One man! The highest of higher powers. Hashtag praise God. Hashtag breakfast club rules, bitches. Triple H is a genius. A genius!